the last thing that I want to do before we actually start working with parallel computing is making sure that all of you that signed up for the, for the hands-on exercises can actually get to the cluster. So and the way to do that is opening your terminal. We're going to do a, a, a secure shell connection to the server. Uh, so this establishes a communication, safe communication channel between you and the, the cluster. Uh, you can do that if you're on the Mac, you open your terminal, if you're in Windows, you open your command prompt. If you're Linux, you also open your terminal. And what we're going to do, we're going to connect to the Xseed uh, single sign-on hub. There is a multi-factor authentication that's going to happen, probably going to send a, a push to your phone or make you a phone call. And then we're going to connect to, to finally connect to the cluster. So the first step is actually connecting to the hub, SSH. This isn't like a letter L. It's not actually a number one. So it's a letter L here. Your username, your exceed username that when you created your, your exceed account and then login, login.exe.org. And once you're there, you do just a GSI SSH expense. And I'm going to do that with you uh, right now. So let's see. So SSH. Um, minus L uh, dash L and then uh, username, my username, use yours. Uh, login.exceed.org. Okay, so it's asking for my password. Good. And then I have the dual setup. Uh, so I'm going to send myself a push. I look at my phone. I got it. Um, Verify my identity. Good. Yeah, so I'm connected to the hub. Uh, and then I'm going to connect to, to, to expense. So I do a GSI, oops, all together, GSI, SSH expense. Right, so you see this uh, expense welcome screen here. How can I make my... Okay, I guess I can. But you can see this nice expense logo here. That means you're successfully connected to the cluster. So if you have any issues, I'm going to give people a couple more minutes. I'm going to also, I'm going to be doing polls to see how you guys uh, are doing over the, the session. So uh, I'm going to launch the first one, which is going to ask whether you are connected or not. Um, so if you are connected or if you're working on it, uh, you know, let me know uh, so I can proceed when everybody's connected. So I'm launching the poll now. And if you're having issues, uh, let me know too. Okay, awesome. So we have a lot of people that are connected. Hey, so, okay. One, people's, one person's working on it. Wait a little bit. Okay, I think, um, I didn't think about it, but I, I don't know if you can change your answer after it. So if you select working on it, I don't know if you can at some point move it to yes. I didn't think about that. So I'll let you work a little bit uh, longer, but if you're, you selected worked, working on it and you're already in there, let me know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, that's good to know. Um, all right, uh, I guess we're all in. So let's proceed. Uh, all right, so let me get my full screen again. Oops, I don't want this here. Let's get my full screen again. All right, so we're all in. Uh, I don't wanna share the results, but I'll share them with you. Um, stop sharing. Okay, Ooh, what's going on here? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so yeah, so let's start with the first block here, the parallel computing overview. The, the first thing that I wanted to say is that why, you know, like why, why, why are you interested in parallel computing? What's happening? Uh, and you might have heard about uh, Moore's law. It's, 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 it's something that says basically that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit 
uh, doubles every two years. Uh, and this for a long time has been the reason for people not to do much about their, their applications, their codes, because as computers get faster, you just need to sit and wait, right? So you can get your code running twice as fast uh, just by waiting uh, two years. Or it's actually something like, if you measure, it's actually like something like 18 months or something. And, and this has been pretty consistent. It's an incredibly uh, 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 very good forecast of what would happen. This is like 50 years ago. Uh, you know, the, the, the transistors were developed in, uh, in the 50s. Uh, John Bardeen won the Nobel Prize in 1956. He actually was a professor here at U of I for the invention of the transistor. So this is like a really bold prediction and it really works nice. And there's not much about science here. It's more about sort of like uh, uh, investment uh, or market uh, uh, thoughts. So the idea is that as they start introducing uh, computers, they would get revenues and reinvest that money and improve the technology. So what you see here is not, it's not something that's closely related to science itself. It's more about investing in science. And you see that, you know, like if you look, log into expense, expense has, it's very small here, but AMD, Epic, Rome, uh, process, processors. So we're here at the top uh, today. Uh, all right, so transistors keep getting uh, uh, more and more packed, but if you look at the uh, clock speed of, of a single processor, uh, which is the number of cycles a CPU ex uh, executes per, per, per second, which gives you a, a measure of how fast it is. Uh, you'll see that around the early uh, 2000s, things started getting flat here, right? So you had like computers that were like faster and faster about processing things. But then by the time we got to Intel Pentium 4, things started to slow down and get pretty flat here. So we can get really like, faster computers uh, or processors anymore. And this is a picture of how a Pentium 4 would look. So in the early 2000s, this was sold a year ago for $80. Um, so what's going on here, right? So, so what is the reason for, 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 we have more transistors back together, but we can't make them, the processors faster. So what's behind that? And I have a poll for that to see what are your guesses. Uh, so please answer that. Okay. Um, I'm going to end the poll. Yeah, I'll share the results. And yeah, it's uh, most of you are right. It's about power dissipation. Uh, so if you look, I'll share another graph here. So this is a more complex uh, graph that, that shows the, the number of transistors packed in a, in a, in a microprocessor. So you can see the Moore's law keeps going, going on and on, and you can see single thread performance. We're gonna, we're gonna be discussing more what this means. But then you look at the frequency here, which is the clock speed, and you can see also the the power that is dissipated in the microchip, and you can see that they coincide here. So the the frequency of the processors stopped increasing when the dissipated power started to get around 100 watts. So why? Because 100 watts per square uh, centimeter here, which is about the same size as a chip, one square centimeter, um, it starts to get so, so hot that things start melting. So we're actually much hotter than a hot plate. Uh, we're actually closer to a nuclear reactor, the, 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 the heat dissipation that happens in the walls of a nuclear reactor. So you, can, you can't make them faster anymore because they just melt. Um, so what is the solution to keep delivering more and more power, uh, more and more processing power? It's actually moving to a multi-core architecture. So instead of having one single processor in a chip, I have several, and I had to learn how to distribute my computer workload to these uh, different processors. So you can see that here in the early 2000s is the onset of, uh, uh, 
uh, multi-core systems, multi-core uh, processor, processor chips. And uh, so he, that's, that's, you know, if, if, you, if you don't understand how to program these things, you're ba if you're running uh, your application in serial without uh, actually benefiting from, from, from uh, uh, parallel, parallelism, you're stuck here. So you don't really need to have a fancy machine. If you, if that's the case, if you want to keep running your serial code, you can just get something for eight eighty dollars, and you know the clock speed is about the same. So it doesn't make any difference. Um, so this is why it's so important to understand how parallel computing works, and uh, this is what we're going to be exploring next. So what is you know in, in more in more like broad terms, what 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 do we need to 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 know about? Uh, uh, like larger concepts that, that are important to, to understand parallel computing. The first one is uh, what is a parallel process versus a sequential or serial process. And this is this is basically like an overview. Oh, I have to stop sharing this, sorry. Uh, this is uh, basically an overview of a daily life situation where you can see sequential processes and parallel processes uh, happening at the same time, the NBA playoffs. Uh, this is the picture for last year um, or this year uh last season so here for instance we have the playoffs right we have the uh the um two conferences and we have the first round the conference sem semifinals the fi conference finals and finally the finals right so these uh so horizontally here these things are sequential you cannot play the first round or the conference semifinals before you play the first round so this is a sequential process you have to wait until this is done However, what is happening here in the uh, vertical direction can be ha happening in parallel, right? Several of these games here, these uh, matchups are happening in parallel. Some of them are happening on, on the same night. Um, and if you couldn't make them parallel, if you had to wait, like, so, so if this matchup would have to wait for this one to happen, and all of them would have to wait for each other, the playoffs would take about four months to take place. And they, if you know the NBA, they take about a month. So this is possible because some of them are happening in parallel, but on the other hand, some of them is naturally sequential. There's no way you can play the finals before playing the first round. So this is basically the picture of a programming application. There are sequential uh, components and there are things that can be uh, uh, running in parallel. And what I hope is that I can show you uh, what are the ones that can be parallelized. So, Here's basically what, how a computer program works. So it's, it's, it's a sequence of instruction blocks. Uh, so an instruction block is something like do this on that and then do something else. So it's a cycle of these things. So this is usually a task, a task and that is usually data or a memory address or whatever it is. And then you go to the next one. So as you go through your programming, your, your computer program here, uh, you move through different blocks sequentially. So this means that probably this block to my right cannot be executed because the left. So one example would be like, okay, task A actually generates some data that I need to access for, for this next block. Uh, so I have to wait for this one to happen. But things on the same block can actually execute it in parallel. So I could do this task and this task on this data and this task on all that data. And this can be doing independently. So I can uh, profit from multi-core architecture to do that. Um, so there's two types of uh, parallelism that you can benefit from. Uh, so instruction, again, is a pair that is task data. So you perform some tasks and some data. And there are two pure ways of executing these things. One of them is called task parallelism. So you perform different tasks at the same time over the same data. That's one, one type of it. And the other one is data parallelism. So you perform the same task, but like now you slice your data across different chunks and each one of your components, each one of your cores, or where you're going to see each one of your threads works on a different chunk of your, of your data block. Uh, and then of course you can have a mixed situation, but you, you let's, let's keep them separate for now. So these are a few terms that we're going to be, I'm going to be kind of like mentioning them every once in a while. So I just wanted to show that to make sure that we're all on the same page and what they mean and what they don't. Uh, so like peak performance is the maximum speed at which the computer can operate. Uh, clock rate, it's a measure of the processor speed. The computer cycle is a short uh, 
shortest time in which a unit of work in your computer can be done. Instructions per second, it's similar to clock rate, but it's basically how quickly a computer can, can issue some instructions. And then these this instructions can be, can be different. It can be like memory reads and writes, can be logical operations, you know, comparing two numbers. They can be floating operations like multiplying, dividing, or subtracting two numbers. They can be integer operations, doing the same as before for integers, and branch instructions and, and, and many others. But the most common that you're going to see around are flops, which are floating point operations. Floating point is basically a real number. Uh, so this is the, the, the measure that you're going to see for a, a um, uh, for performance in, in supercomputing clusters. So it's like, how fast can I do? subtract, add, and divide, and multiply numbers, because that's basically the core of your uh, uh, programming. Uh, your, your program is, is, is actually doing some math on, on some data structure. Uh, another term that we're going to be using is a speed up. So that this measures the benefit of parallelism, shows how faster or how my program, uh, my application scales as I add more and more uh, processors to it. And the last thing is a benchmark. So this is to compare different performances over different systems. So one example of a benchmark is the LIMPAC benchmark that is used to build this list here, which is the top 500 supercomputers. And I have to show you that because this just came out yesterday. It's the updated list for the top 500 supercomputers in the world that was updated yesterday at the Supercomputing National Conference or International Conference or whatever it is. Uh, so this is the top 10. You can see that uh, Fugaku in Japan has over 7 million cores. So if you really want to use this, some of the power of these machines, you have to learn uh, parallel computing uh, if you want to profit from them. So I just wanted to share this because I thought it was cool that they just released it yesterday. Okay, uh, let's get back to it. In terms of computers themselves, uh, there are a few things that, that, that are interesting to, to know about them uh, when you think about parallelism. The first one is the processing units, that's PUs, right? We're talking about CPUs and GPUs a lot these days. So this is a sort of, it's not a continuum, right? It's not a spectrum, but there's like, some of them have moderate numbers of powerful proce processors. These are called CPUs, central processing units. And there are some of them that have a larger number of moderate processors. So they have a lot, a uh, large number of small cores that are not as powerful as the ones that are in the GP, in a, in a, in a CPU. Uh, so they go from one to here. Here you can think about like expense, for instance, have, uh, has, been, has a AMD Epic uh, uh, processors and they have 60 cores back together. And if you look at their associated GPU, uh, there are NVIDIA V100s. I think they have about 5,000 uh, uh, cores and then packs them together. And the way these things work together these days is that you have a sort of like a CPU node and attached to this node, you have one of these accelerators here. They talk to each other via this PCI interconnect thing. Uh, so this is basically the setup that you're going to be see a lot in the, the computing clusters over the next uh, decade or so. This is very uh, state of the art today. Uh, the other thing that is important about parallel computers is the memory. How how is the memory organized? We have so many like processing units now. So how how they talk to how do they talk to each other? How do they know about a variable that it, that exists and 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 for and, and can be seen from one of these cores? So there there are basically three models, and the first two ones are obviously the most important for us here. So there's Distributed memory. So in distributed distributed memory system, each central processing unit has its own local memory and they're not connected to each other. So if CPU one needs some data that is hosted uh, uh, on the, in the memory of CPU two, it has to go through the network and ask CPU two for the data. CPU two gets the data and sends it over to CPU one over the network. So there's a lot of communication here uh, on these systems. You have to talk, the, 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 the processing elements need to talk to each other. The other framework, uh, the other 
paradigm of memory organization is shared memory. So you have several CPUs, they are all connected to a network and, and they have a shared memory space. So CPU one has some data that she, uh, they're working here, but CPU two, if they need the data too, they can access it. They don't have to ask CPU one to, to uh, um, send them over or anything. So this is, this is more like it's easier that in the sense that you don't have to be passing messages around and we're going to know we're going to we're going to learn a, a little bit more of what message passing means uh so this is this is a more friendly uh platform for 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 people that are getting their first exposition to uh parallel computing because you don't have to worry about communication and the last one is of course it's a mix of them and this is not very common uh you won't be seeing this around it's sort of like you have some CPUs clustered together and they have access to a network and they have their own memory, but there is a sort of software or an application that virtualizes those uh, separate, physically separated memories. Uh, so you don't really have to do the, 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 the communication, but this is being, uh, this is sort of transparent to the user. So the, there is some sort of communication happening but it's taken care of by some sort of an environment. Uh, so this is not very common. We're, we're, we're gonna be working with these two over the parallel computing track. Another thing is uh, flow of control. So this is uh, one way to, to classify the flow of control is through Flynn's uh, taxonomy. So it's descri it describes how streams of instructions interact with the streams of data. So here on the this side, we have inst uh, instruction streams. And here we have data streams. So I can have, for instance, single instruction on single data. Uh, so of course, if, if it's all single, this is not naturally not par paralyzable. So I have one single instruction happening on one single chunk of data. And I just have one processing unit. This is what was, uh, this is the flow control of personal computers until the early uh, 2000s or uh, until 2010, more or less, 2008. Uh, the other paradigm here is uh, actually having single instructions issued over multiple data. So you have one instruction here coming from the instruction pool, but you have several data chunks, each one going to a different processing unit. This is parallelizable. So I can't uh, parallelize the instruction to run over each data each chunk of data and send it over to a, one of the processing units. This is typically what you see happening in, 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 in processors that are that started coming over on the uh, 2013, 2014. So Intel Knights Landing and AMD Bulldozer are, are one of those. The next type of flow control is uh, multiple instructions on single data. This is, you know, I just have one chunk of data that is being passed over to different PUs and each one of the PUs are actually executing different tasks. This is scalable, but it's not very common because there's there's just a finite number of instructions that that you can you can do. Uh, but this is generally used for full to tolerance uh, 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 computers. So there are things that are built for full tolerance like uh, NASA space shuttle flight control computer. So you have, you know, if, if, if some of your, of your um, calculations go wrong for, for a space shuttle, uh, things can get pretty, pretty difficult for people that are in the, in the space shuttle, in the, in the rocket or whatever it is. Um, so you don't want that. So you want to calculate things in different ways, make sure they all match together. And if one of them doesn't match, you need to know what's going on. So this is um, uh, basically one type of paradigm that you see for systems that require a large fault tolerance, uh, that require no fault. What will be this? Well, you know, you cannot make mistakes. So you have to, this is common for that kind of situation. And the last one, which is uh, basically what you see on every supercomputer since 2010, is actually multiple instructions and multiple data. Uh, so I can divide my my data pool and send chunks over to different processing units. And I can also divide my instruction pool and send different instructions to different processing units. So this is uh, uh, basically how, how, how every single supercomputer works these days. So we're gonna be focusing on this. 
the last thing that I have to talk about parallel computers is how they talk to each other. So we've seen how the memory is organized, but you can also think about it in terms of a network, right? So that thing that makes them talk to each other is actually the network. So it's a platform that has wires, cables that define how multiple processors are connected to each other and, uh, and to their memory units. There are a few characteristics of a network that are important. I'm not going to go for all of them here. This is just for, for reference, but they're, they're basically all summarized in the, on the topology of the network. So this is the configuration of the network. Uh, and here's a couple of examples here, graphical examples of uh, the Atlas a supercomputer on LLL and LL. NL. Um, it has uh, over a thousand nodes. And we also have Jaguar here on uh, uh, Oak Ridge. And uh, this is a much bigger system, uh, has almost 20,000 nodes. And you can see this is shaped in like a donut. And there are many others, uh, topo many other topologies that you can check on this link here later. This is just uh, uh, some high level thing. Okay. And then I've been talking about uh, cores and processes, and I think I went over a little, like talking about threads. What are these things? How they, how, you know, we're going to be using the thread concept a lot. So I wanted to make sure that we're on the same page here. So a thread is the smallest sequence of instructions that your operational system scheduler, uh, which sends uh, uh, loads to the processing unit can manage. So it's, it's, it's just like a block of instruction. Uh, so, and then the process is composed of threads. And what is a process? Well, you have your program that is a set of instructions, right? You say, do this and do that and that. This program is compiled and it sits on a disk, but then you run it. What happens is you load this uh, set of instructions into memory and then it becomes a process. And then each process is divided in different threads. And then you have a sort of like a queue here where you schedule, you schedule your goals and picks up the threads and send it to the CPU and processes everything that is included and close it in your, in your, in your program here. Uh, so they can have priorities and we can set these priorities or we, uh, but the, the beauty is that a lot of the computing, uh, parallel computing frameworks uh, like OpenMP and MPI, they do a lot of this uh, by default. So you don't have to, you know, I, I, you probably can see there's a lot of knobs here to, to handle. And the good thing is that this, this uh, OpenMP and MPI take, take care of a lot of these by default. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, so here is the, the frameworks that are most common these days and they're most used in, 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 in HPC. Uh, so we have, again, we have a CPU node or a CPU uh, processor chip. That is, a, so that, who is, that is connected to a GPU that has many cores uh, and they talk to each other. And you have several of these nodes across your system. So OpenMP allows you to do parallelism on a single node, shared memory. OpenACC allows you to do parallelism on the GPU. And MPI is what makes you talk to other nodes. So distrib distributed memory. We're going to be focusing on OpenMP here because this is an introduction. It's the, simple, the simplest framework to work, but we're also going to be offering training on MPI and OpenACC for interest. Keep an eye on it, uh, and we'll get there at some point. Okay, uh, so this was uh, my introduction. Uh, I think it took 30 minutes, so that's great. Uh, so let's start working on the exercise. Okay, uh, and if you have... I don't see any questions, but if you have questions about the first part, this is a good stopping point. Uh, or if you want to save it for the end, whatever you prefer. Okay, so let's let's go into exercises. Uh, so before we we work on the exercises, we actually need the exercises, right? The code. And the code is sitting here in this GitHub repo. So I'm going to open this and send this link to you. because I wanted to clone this. Uh, yeah, so what we're gonna do is like, we're all logged in expense, I hope. 
I didn't lose my connection. No, I didn't. I hope you didn't either. If you did, just repeat the steps before. But I, you can see here, I'm still on expense. And I just did an LS to show that I don't have anything in my in my um, uh, working uh, area. Uh, you're probably seeing the same thing. If you do an LS, you won't see anything because you just, I think your account is brand new. Uh, but we want to get the exercises that are on GitHub here. Here's GitHub. Uh, yeah, there it is. At three exercises. There's, you know, in case you want to go for them later, there's some, some, uh, instructions and things like that here they're sitting here and we want to have all these stuff on our expense uh, account so let's do a git clone oh git clone and well i already copied this thing so you can copy it uh, from the chat and you just paste it here uh do i have to I think ooh, there might be something wrong here. Let's see. No, it worked. Okay. And then you do an LS and here it is. Do you see that you now have all the exercises? Uh, so let me make sure that all of you are able to do this and we'll proceed. Here's a poll. Do I have a poll here? No, yeah, okay. All right. Fantastic. I'm very happy that everyone can can do it. Thanks. Thanks for confirming. Uh, good. I don't want to share the results for this one. Uh, so let's keep moving. Everybody has the exercises on now. You're free to, like, as I go for them, you know, you don't necessarily have to be looking at my screen. You're free to navigate through your expense. And, and, and if you knew, if you want to look at the GitHub repo, if you want to look at the, the slides on, at your own pace, you know, this is going to be pretty like uh, open. So feel free to to navigate. If it's too important, I'll make sure that I that I that I call your attention to it. Okay, let's get back to this. Um, so why OpenMP? Why are we using OpenMP? Um, I kind of like already gave the hint that it's like the simplest uh, uh, um, parallel computing paradigm that we can be using or framework that we can be using. But what it is, is the first is that this is from the website. So it's uh, an API that supports multi-platform shared memory, multi-processing in C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, so it's, it's composed of uh, a set of compiler directives, library, routings, and environment variables that control what your application does at runtime. So how it runs, basically, what's doing and, and, and things like that. What is good about it is that it's simple, it's robust, and it's, it's a very mature framework. So it's really, and, and, and it's also like on the roadmap for, for, for every supercomputing cluster uh, uh, in the next decade. So it's not going to go away. So if you learn it now, you're going to be using it for a while. Uh, it's also incorporated into every major compiler, so it doesn't require any installation. Unless you're doing that on our laptop, you probably have to install something, but it's not very difficult. If you go to their website, there's a lot of instructions there. It also allows you for incremental parallelism. Uh, so you can do, you can transform uh, chunks of your serial code into parallel code little by little, and, and that's, that's a good advantage if that's your first time doing things like that. Uh, it does not require message passing because we have a shared memory. Every core, every processing unit, or every thread knows about the entire memory address that is available to that application and allows you for reasonable uh, uh, speed-ups with very little work, as you will, uh, hopefully I'll convince you uh, that this is possible today. What is not that cool about it is that it's not fully scalable by itself because you're, you're basically uh, 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 confined to a single node or a single uh, uh, set of cores that share the memory. Uh, the other thing is that that is not so cool about it is that it does not require to redesign or actually create new applications with a parallel computing paradigm in mind. And that's something that I, that I wanted to, to kind of like start thinking about is like, not only how you transform serial applications into parallel ones, but if you are to create a new application, how you start it from scratch with a parallel computing uh, in mind, uh, paradigm in mind, 
because that's the actually the path for, for fully scalable applications. And there's another issue that performance is usually limited by your sequential blocks. This is not only an OpenMP issue, it's basically a parallel computing issue. If you have sequential blocks, your overall uh, application speed up and when you parallelize it is gonna be uh, very dependent on the, on the sequential blocks. So on how much of your code is sequential. This is often called as Amidol's law. I'm not gonna go into it because it's something like that people claim, oh, I'm not gonna do a parallelize because of Amidol's law. There's a lot of flaws about that uh, statement. So uh, I'm not really gonna go over it, but here are a few you know, good things. And we're trying to be honest here. I really like OpenMP, but there, there, there are some limitations. All right, uh, so the thing is that OpenMP allows you to easily create these parallel regions in your code. So here are uh, blocks of codes and you usually have a serial block uh, that is run by a single thread and then you create a parallel region where you actually want the tasks in that region to be performed by more than one thread and uh, like whatever number that you have available to you. And then what happens here is that at the beginning of the parallel uh, uh, section or the parallel region, a team of threads is created by thread number zero, which is also called the main thread or the parent thread or the manager. So it creates a team of threads and then we distribute the loads to each one of them. And then they execute their tasks. And as they're done with their tasks, they sit at the end of the parallel region and they all wait, wait for each other until they can move on to the next block, right? So this is important. Uh, in parallel regions, basically what, what this is saying is that there is a barrier at the end of the parallel region. So the threads are not going to start just jumping to the next region, uh, uh, either serial or parallel, if, if some of them are still working. Uh, there's a way to do that, but it's more complicated than what we want to do today. Okay, uh, so what is the syntax to create uh, an OpenMP parallel region? Uh, so to my left, C and C++, to my right, Fortran. I'm not sure if all of you are, you know, uh, I think those are pretty common languages. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm gonna be focusing more on C++ here because I think it's probably, uh, I don't know, I have the feeling that more people know that, but I might be wrong. So uh, yeah, give me some feedback for this after that. But I'm gonna focus, focus on, on C++. And if you don't know C++, don't worry. I'm gonna, you know, the codes are very simple and I'm gonna go for each one of the steps, what they're doing and what they're not. Uh, so uh, bear with me for a while while I talk about C++ if you don't know, know it. Uh, so the first thing is that we have a, a header, right? We have to include OpenMP as a library to our code. Our code doesn't know, you know, if your serial application doesn't know about OpenMP as it doesn't know about many other of your packages that you're using, but you have to tell them, hey, I'm using this package. So yeah, I'm using OpenMP. So you have to declare that in your, in your header. And then we have a serial chunks of code. Then we finally start creating our parallel uh, region, uh, which with the OpenMP parallel directive. So if you're doing C++ here, what you do that through a pragma, uh, which is, it's sort of like a compiler instruction. So it starts with a comment line, but it's not a comment. Uh, similar for Fortran, you just do the dollar sign OpenMP after the exclamation mark here. And then you do the instructions that you want in, within this region to be executed in parallel. This is basically the syntax. So here are the parallel blocks of your code and the other ones are serial blocks if you don't do anything else. So first one, we're gonna do the hello world, right? This is how people start coding on a different a new framework. This is OpenMP is not a language, I know, but we're going to do hello world. So let me paste this in the chat so you can take a look at the code. If you're, if you're not comfortable with opening the, oh, we have a chat question here, sorry. So let me send the link. OpenMP is only C, C++, and Fortran. Yes, it is. It's these are the only supported languages by OpenMP. I think there are ways that you can, in different languages, that you can use some sort of OpenMP, but officially supported, yes, these are the only ones. Uh, you might be wondering about Python, and Python are, 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 is a very common language these days. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you, Emily. Uh, so Python has a problem when it comes to shared memory parallelism. Python has this thing called the GIL, the global interlock, global interconnect locked, in global interpreter lock. So because Python has a different way of thinking about uh, uh, allocating memory and things like that. So it really has a hard time when you're using a parallel computing paradigm in shared memory architectures. So you can use parallelism with Python with MPI, there are packages for that, but not with OpenMD. So yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, so I, I, I pasted the, the link in the chat and the idea is that, and I'm gonna kind of share this with you, right? So if you have, if you don't have two screens, don't worry, but you have three screens, you can have uh, the zoom open and you can also go through the code at the same time. I know this is a pretty simple code, so you can just take a look at it real quick. Uh, and if I'm going through it in your board, you can take a look at my beautiful license here. Uh, I know it's a pretty big license, but you know, we're trying to take care of property. Um, so yeah, so, okay. So I'm not gonna go through the GitHub for every code because I have screenshots of this. So I'll be showing actually screenshots of these, these things and we're gonna be pointing to, to the important parts of the code, but you're free to browse through the GitHub repo at any time you want. Okay, so where's my presentation? Okay, here we are, back. Uh, yeah, so here's an example. For this one, I'm, I'm able to actually do a screenshot of the entire code. Now, uh, of course, not of my beautiful uh, license, but of the code. Uh, so yeah, so let's take a look at what this is. The first thing is that, well, first of all, we include things. Uh, this is the serial code, right? I'm talking about the serial code, not the parallelized one yet. Uh, I'm using a namespace just so I can get access to the standard library. Uh, and then I start my, my actually running my application, right? So the first thing is that I allocate some messaging memory. This message is just a string, it's hello parallel world. And then what I do is that I just print this message to the standard output, which is either your, your terminal or as we're gonna be doing here, it's gonna be a file that is created by the, the, the batch scheduler. I'm gonna go into more details about this in a minute. Uh, for one, shall we use the text editor to, pay, to paste code? You won't have to do it. The code is already there. Uh, when you clone the repo uh, in the beginning of the, the this section, the code is already there. You won't you won't have to to write anything. Uh, of course, you're more than welcome to open it and and change things as you want as we go through it. But uh, you won't you won't have to to run the code. You won't have to do anything. Okay. Or well. You have to give instructions to run, but you won't have the code. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so this is what the code does, right? It just prints out hello world. Uh, so what do we want to do? First, what I want to do, I want to show you how to do this printing over multiple threads. I want to do that multiple times uh, in parallel at the same time. So I want to make each available thread print the hello message. Uh, so how do I do that? Is I insert open and be parallel directive. And I have a poll for you here. And the poll is where should I insert the directives here? Uh, and I'm going to launch the poll. Where do you think, you know, this is, I'm not, I'm not grading this guys, just, just give your guess. Okay, good. Everybody answered. I'm going to share the results. And as you can see here, uh, most people guess line number 35, but some people also guess line 32 and 33. And these are the most obvious alternatives if you want to parallelize this code. Uh, but one of them is better than the other. So here's the link to the parallelize code. Uh, you know, grab it and take a look at it on GitHub if you, if you, 
if you want, but I'm going to sh uh, show screenshots. Here's how you do it. It was actually on line 35. Um, and why? I'm going to explain that in a minute. Why? Uh, so here's how you do it. You open and close around the print, printing the message. Why don't you do it on line 30 before or line 32 or 33, which are, are the next uh, guesses here? Because here I'm actually allocating memory. And remember on these two lines here, remember this is shared memory. So I don't, if I include these two lines in the parallel region, I'm going to make each thread allocate a message in the memory. And they all share memory, so I don't have to have each one of them do that. I can have one of them do it, which is thread zero or the main thread. And then this is going to be available to all of the other threads. So that's why you don't have the, the you don't open the region here, even though you can. And it will work for this application, it will work just the same, but you will have allocated more, you have you would have had allocated more memory than what you actually need if you insert the, the directive here. Okay, so I'm gonna also be working with you guys on uh, workflow diagrams, because this is really helpful when you're doing, uh, when you're prototyping your parallel application. Uh, so here's the start from the, from the end of your, your application and it goes actually, up, obviously top bottom. And the first part of it, you're allocating memory and you do that on a single thread. Just, just the reason for that we just discussed. This is shared memory. Um, and then you go into the parallel region. So each one of the threads that I have available is going to go and do the same task over the same data, which is hello. So they're going to print the message. Great. Let's run this. Uh, usually compilation of parallel code is pretty simple with OpenMP all the compilers support it. So the syntax is compiler, the OpenMP flag, your source code minus dash O, your target target uh, binary. For this current example, G++, we're gonna be doing GCC all over. Uh, uh, the, the flag for GCC, it's uh, dash F OpenMP, hello OpenMP.cpp minus O, hello OpenMP. Uh, exe and here are the flags for different compilers and here are the headers for different languages um right so you can do compilation if you want this way but for today i have a make file because i didn't want to go over compilation so i just set up uh and i'm trying to get my presentation back oh i have to okay sorry for that uh a little confusion, uh, but yeah, you can just do make. So here we are. You have to move to an intro to PC to actually access the exercises. And if you do an LS here, you see the hello is there. So you change to hello. If you do another LS, there's a serial folder and the OpenMP folder. We'll, we want to work on the OpenMP folder, CD OpenMP. Uh, and you can see here, there's the source code and there's the make file. If you want to compile with G++, you can, or you can just type make and that will compile for you. All right. So after you compile, you see that your uh, uh, executable is here. And here's the thing, how do we run this, right? So let's see, usually, you know, how many threads I'm gonna be engaging in this parallel region. Um, so you can control that using a, an environment variable. Uh, so this environment variable, it's uh, called OpenMP or o o OMP underscore num underscore thread. It's a very suggestive name. And the way you control it is by exporting this uh, a variable as a certain value. And then you run your binary. And after you do that, when you start running your application, there is an OpenMP directive now there and then you're going to look it's going to look for this environment variable and then it's going to launch that team of threads according to this but again you don't have to do any of this today because i have set up we're actually using a computing cluster so you cannot run things as they are right now because you're in a logging node and we want to get into the compute nodes 
So I already have a job script there. If you know what a job script is, so here's how it looks. So it's a bunch of instructions telling what I'm running, where I'm running, how many tasks I'm requiring, how much memory I'm requiring, what is the account where this is going to run, how long do I want this to run. As you can see here, what I'm going to do is basically on this batch job, I'm sending it over the, the batch scheduler, the, the cluster batch scheduler, and telling, hey, I want eight threads, and you're going to run my application. So all you have to do is sending this batch script to the batch manager. So as batch, hello, uh, dot job script. And this should be very fast. You should get a, an ID with your, uh, uh, with your uh, job ID. And if you want to check if it ran or not, it probably did. So you can do an SQ minus U uh, dollar sign user. Dollar sign user is just you. Uh, yeah, so I don't even see mine here, which means it probably ran. Um, and uh, you can use cat to actually take a look at the output. So yeah, so I have, you see like the output is hello dash your job ID dot out, which is right here for me. So I can do a cat there. Hello, blah, blah, blah. And here's how it looks for me. Uh, so I encourage you to actually paste it in the chat, whatever you got there. All right, Hector, so uh, what, what I wanted you to paste is actually the output of when you do a cat in that file there. So if you do a cat, hello, and you can use tab, tab will help you find it. And then you paste, it. yes, great. Yeah, uh, so good, thanks, thanks everyone uh, that is pasting it. And uh, yeah, so, as you can see, the output is a little, say, wonky. You know, uh, why? So let's get back to it. So let's make sense of what's going on. So here is a typical one. Uh, probably for, for some of you, it's different. But we have one that is, Emily, your, yours looks beautiful, but it's a very rare case. Uh, so usually it's a little wonky. Why? What's going on? Uh, the first thing that I'm a very optimistic person. So the first thing that I noticed, remember that we were, if you look at the batch script there, we're actually using eight threads. This is important because this is the first actor yours look pretty good too. The first thing that I noticed here is that, well, okay, at least eight lines were printed, but we have double lines and we also have empty lines. Why? What's going on? Remember that what we're doing here, we're allocating a message and then we're creating a parallel region and we're saying to each thread on that parallel region, just print hello world, but we're actually issuing a couple different things here, right? To the standard output. We're first thing send hello, and then we're sending and line to finish the line. So there's actually two instructions being sent by each thread to the standard output. So this is how it is. We're doing, making each of the thread print in the message. So at the beginning of the region, they're all here, but then, I might have a situation where I have fast threads and slow threads. So the fast thread already issued the entire instruction where the slow thread is still issuing hello. So I end up getting something like this. So the first fast thread issued the entire thing while the slow thread haven't completed the instruction yet. So I get that kind of situation. Or I can be in a situation where the fast thread already printed a message and then the slow thread is finally printing the end line where I get a blank line. Uh, so this is actually a good thing. It might make you think about, well, this is a little confusing. Yes, uh, the output is confusing, but it's a good thing. It's a good feature because that means that threads can run their tasks independently and asynchronously. So this is fundamental for parallelization. You want them to be independent. The thing is that here you're actually sharing your output. So they're going to be throwing things on that output without worrying too much about the others or without worrying at all about the others. 
So things like that happen. And there's ways, if you really want an organized output, there are ways that you can handle this. But this shows you a very fundamental concept of uh, parallel computing. Things happen independently. Okay. Uh, I think this is a good first introduction uh, for us to understand what's going on. And so let's move into more advanced uh, exercises. And this is going to be just the way we're going to be doing it. It's basically compiling with make and then sending a job to the to the to the cluster batch scheduler and checking on the output. Uh, but hopefully, um, and then I'll show you later uh, more exercises that you can work on if you want to actually try and insert your directives uh, in different exercises. We have more, but today I'm basically just like going uh, slowly over each one of the the selected exercises. Okay, uh, so let's go to the task parallelism. The, the one that we did is pretty simple, but you know it, it's 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 it is what it is. It's hello world. Let's do something more substantial. So let's start with task parallelism. So again, what it is is like I have many tasks and I want them execute independently over the same chunk of data, the same uh, data set, uh, and this is corresponding in terms of uh, flow control, uh, flow of control, it's the mul multiple and structure single data uh, example of the flame taxonomy. Uh, so we have one pool of data and we're sending it, it over to different PUs or threads here in the case. Uh, and uh, we have different instructions there. So one code that can, oh, how do we do that? <laughs> Sorry, how do we do that in, in, with OpenMP? What is the syntax? So the building block, the stepping stone is a parallel region. So we're gonna always be using a parallel region, but now we're gonna add another feature with our parallel sections. So here's the syntax. Again, the header, serial code, and then I open the, 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 the parallel region with the parallel directive. But now I add uh, sections to it. And I, I add the sections uh, directive, and this is gonna tell the compiler that, hey, there are instructions for each thread coming over. And I separate the instructions for each thread by a OpenMP section, no plural here, for each one of the tasks that I want to be executed. This is basically how it goes. In terms of a workflow, here's what's going on. We have a serial code that's doing something here, maybe prepping our data or allocating messages and, and variables that we want to use. And then we go into the parallel region uh, where things, you know, the main thread creates a team of threads and we want to divide the tasks to each thread. And we do that by creating OpenMP section, by inserting OpenMP section. So this task A is going to be executed by thread zero. And the numbers here are just like, they're, they're illustrative, right? That, that there's just, just to make sure of that. Uh, you know, thread zero and thread one, you know, it's not necessarily a thread zero is going to do uh, task A. It could be thread three. There's no, you know, there's, things are a, a little bit asynchronous here. So the thread that actually gets task A doesn't have necessarily to be thread uh, zero, but actually the thread that is available as soon as possible. And then we go to, to task B and so on and so forth. So here's the code. Uh, that I want to work with you guys is uh, I'm going to paste the well I, I think if you can't find your way in a GitHub repo let me know I'll paste it but I'm not going to paste it now because I think that you guys may have found it already but here it is uh, if you look at that this is a little bigger code right uh, so what it does it calculates uh, some simple statistical properties of a set of real numbers that are organized into an array uh, so here's how it looks. Uh, we have, uh, to start off, we have some libraries, and then we define the size of our array, which is 2 to the 20, 27th, 27th power. Um, and then we have our functions, you know, uh, what the, the statistical properties that I want to calculate. I want to find the minimum of this set of numbers, the maximum value, and the average of them. Uh, and then we have the implementation. So the implementation, 
I what I have here is just I know it's a big block, but what it's doing is just filling out the vector, the two to twenty seven vector with random numbers. So that's all it's doing here. And finally, I call each one of these functions on the vector. Now, how 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 do the this function looks look uh, like, or how do they look? Uh, they look like this. Um, so they're very straightforward implementations of this simple uh, operations. So for min, I just go over the entire vector and find the minimum value, and print it out. For max, I do the same. And for uh, average, I go over the vector, add all the numbers, and finally divide by the size of the vector. OK, uh, so question. If I want to parallelize this, uh, what do I do? Uh, okay, let me share my poll here. Where's my polls? Okay, here it is. My question too is a little different this time. So can each of these functions be calculated independently? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna end the poll. Everybody answered yes, and yeah. Well, I guess we're doing task parallelism, right? So we hope so. But be careful, because it's not always the case. For this case here, what we're doing, I'm gonna get back one slide here. We're not making uh, writes to the vector for just reading it. So we're never changing the values here, right? So it, it's okay. But if we had a function that is actually changing the values, this is called like data uh, racing or data concurrency, then we have to be careful. We cannot just parallelize the tasks because as I'm running one task on the data, it's changing the content of the data that the other task is accessing it. So I don't want that. But in this case, it's safe because they're all just reading. There's no writes there. Okay. Uh, so the parallelized code is in the Git repo and Here's how it looks. First of all, in the header, include the OpenMP uh, library. Um, and then, sorry. And then the rest is the same. Uh, array size is the same. I call the function, I, I declare the function is the same. And then uh, the first block here where I'm just distributing uh, uh, things is the same because again, I don't want all the threads to create a vector. I want just one of them create a vector. You might find that I added like a, uh, some uh, time structures here, which is just to measure how much my parallel, how, how long to execute my parallel region is taking. So don't worry too much about that. It's just to give you uh, measurements. And then finally, what I do is that I call my clock, my stopwatch at the beginning, at the end of the parallel region. And then I do my, 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 my OpenMP, uh, here's the parallel block. So here's, I do my sections. Uh, and then I distribute each one of the functions to one thread. So I'm going to tell you thread, whatever it is, thread is available, come and grab this function. Thread that is available, grab, come and grab this function. This all happened at the same time. Okay. Uh, what, about, what about the implementation of each function? So if you look at the implementation of each function in the parallelized code, they're the same. So this is really great uh, way of doing things with OpenMP. We don't change the function at all and we are executing them in parallel. So that's great. I don't have to worry about my functions. Uh, good. Uh, so this is how it looks in terms of the workflow diagram. So I have uh, the serial region, which is just allocating and filling the vector with random numbers. And then I have the parallel block. And then each one of the instructions, each of the instructions in the section block are going to be doing one of my functions here. Uh, cool. Uh, I think we're up. If the vector is long enough, could you chunk the data to within each OpenMP section? Yes, Hector, we can. 
Thank you for your question. We're going to do that in the next exercise, which is data parallelism. So yeah, we'll learn how to do that too. All right, so here we go again. Compile, you have to make sure you're on the stats folder in, in Expanse. Compile, send your job, uh, keep track. This might take a few seconds, not much. And then look at the output and send it over to chat. I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on this. And let me know if you have questions in the meantime. All right, we're starting to see some. So Francisco, yeah. So you're gonna see that as your code runs, you're gonna be having, because what's happening there, uh, sorry, let, maybe I can show you, you all what I'm talking about instead of just talking. Right, so let's see. I'm gonna move to the, to the stats folder. I'm going to change to the open MP. And if you look at the job script, what I'm doing is actually doing a loop here where I do, I, I run the same code over and over again with one, two, three, four, five, and six threads. Yeah, uh, Chad, it's going to be running for a couple of minutes. And as you get the output, you can do cat output, cat output, and it's going to start feeling what's going on there all the way to six threads as it runs. All right, so we have we have one, we have, we have a couple. Yes, all right, great, yeah. So yeah, you you got all of the six threads running. Yeah, so I think everybody's is in good shape here. Uh, so let's take a look at how we analyze the performance of this parallelization. Right, we we ran it with six threads. What's going on? Um, So here's what's going on. There's a poll for you guys. This is what's going on. So the poll is about, is there a limit for the performance gain of this paralyzed stats application? Yes, no, uh, what do you think? My first uh, statement on this question is a little odd. So what I meant by yes, adding more threads won't help instead of happen on that first one. Sorry for that. Okay. Eight, nine, good, 10. All right, uh, so most of you said, yes, adding more threads won't help. And then some of you said, no, more threads, the better. And one person said, yes, for a different reason. And uh, if that person wants to say, what is a different reason? Do you want to? If you don't, it's okay. Um, yeah, I guess on mine, it looked like there was a small gain with uh, adding threads, but it, it I, I guess, it just didn't seem like a huge gain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's well noticed. Yeah, that happens. Uh, I will show try to show you why. But ideally, you don't expect to get gains for adding more threads because you only have a, a finite number of tasks. So we'll go over there. Uh, we'll get there. And but but here's a typical result. As I get one thread, it's 1.32 seconds. This for expense, it might have been a, a little different. I ran this on a different system, but this is just a, basically how it looks. So we can just plot this raw numbers here, but this is not very helpful. I, I, it doesn't tell me much of how much I'm gaining and things like that. So the way to actually look for performance is you compare the time that it takes to run it with one thread to the time that it takes 
to run it in multiple threads. So T1 by Tn. And here are the values that you can see. So this is, so this gives you a better sense of like, okay, so if that's two, that means that uh, with n threads, my application is actually running twice as fast with just one thread than with just one thread. And here's uh, what uh, Hector was referring to. Like at some point, adding more threads actually increases my performance. Uh, but this is just a matter of uh, fluctuations. You know, like threads, they, they can be, this is a shared resource that we're using now. So threads can be busy with other things. Memory is, is not uh, only available to your application. It's shared between different applications too. So threads are busy. So if you're really interested in measuring performance, what you should do is actually run this thing a few times, 10 times maybe. So here's an example of uh, when you average it over 10 times. Uh, so you can see that after three threads, the performance is pretty flat. It doesn't change anymore. Why? Well, let's see why. Uh, performance doesn't change when you increase. Why is that? Well, we only have three three uh, uh, threads being actually handled uh, uh, assigned with tasks. So the other ones are just sitting idle there. So what happens is, uh, so for the case when you add more than three threads and you do get a little performance advantage is that you're just allocating a few more threads and some of them are a little faster. So you might run it a little faster. So you got, if you allocate, so think about it, if you allocate 10 threads and you're only using three, probably the three, three ones that you're gonna get are a little faster than if you just allocate three of them, right? So there's a little, but but if you average over, it it, it just goes away. Uh, it just goes away. So to the fact that it starts level out there, threads relate to the fact that we asked it to compute three quantities. Yes, exactly. So, uh, right. So to the fact that it starts level, exactly. Uh, that's exactly why, uh, Emily, I hope I answered your question. If not, let me know. Uh, the last thing is that that I kind of want to pay uh, point your attention to here is like okay yeah we're we're executing three tasks on different threads but our overall performance when I run it with three threads it's actually like two point four so why am I not getting um, uh, three times faster well that's one thing that you have to consider when you're doing task parallelization so here are uh, the code here's the code for each one of the tasks that we have max or min, max, and average. So min, what I'm doing is like actually going for the entire vector and just doing comparison. Uh, see if it's smaller than, and then I update min. For max, same with, with, the, with this guy here. But for, for uh, average, I'm actually adding a, making a point, uh, floating point operation for each single iteration. So as you may have guessed, just comparing to the numbers, it's actually faster or takes less time than just than adding two flo uh, floating points. And when you add, uh, when you, um, if you measure the, the, the time it takes to run each of the functions, you're gonna see something that resembles this. So it takes about the same time to run max and min, but it takes almost 35% more to actually run uh, average. So this is basically what you're seeing. You're having uh, the idle threads at the end of your parallel region are the ones that actually ran these two functions that take less. And the busy thread is still computing. And remember that at the end of the parallel region, you have a sort of barrier. They won't proceed until all of them are done. So your execution time, it's completely dominated by the thread with the largest workload. Uh, so uh, this, um, this means that if you really want to be efficient about uh, getting, if you want to really get uh, the best performance, you have to think about how to distribute your workload. So basically what you would do here is either try to balance out, find, uh, you know, uh, doing some other tasks inside each one of this function. So they're also busy, or uh, you just do it in a different parallel region, but this is not a very good example of uh, uh, workload balance. Why? Because one of the threads it's considerably uh, um, uh, faster or, or considerably has more work 
to do than the other threads. So finding a balance between uh, that, it's, it's always important. But you still got 2.4% 2.4 times faster. So if your application took three days to run, it's going to take now only over a day with a couple of directives that you inserted. So this is surprising or not surprising, but this is a great game. Um, Abdel does thread overhead. The other computing power is to set up a thread to load down a task. It does uh, if you're using many, 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 many threads. So if you're doing OpenMP, uh, here we have a node and an expense usually has 128 threads available. If you're using all of them, there is some parallel overhead. We're going to see that in the next exercise. But here, three threads, no, it's just a blink. It, it, it's not a performance issue here. It's really about, I mean, one of them actually um, uh, being slower than the others. Okay, so one thing that you can do to, to kind of like understand this, it's like comment out the part that, that, uh, that does the average and only do uh, the first two that are balanced. And you're gonna see that you get, you get a two, two times performance improvement when you run it. Okay, good. Uh, this is one way to, to, to think about performance analysis when you're doing task parallelism. And finally, and we have 25 minutes to do that. So I think we're in good shape. Uh, we're gonna do the, uh, data parallelism. That is by far the most common thing that you're gonna see around. Why? Uh, because you're just distributing the same task to different chunks of data. And this is like exactly what you do in a loop, like a for loop or a do loop. You do the same thing over and over again over different elements of your vector or matrix, matrix or whatever it is. So by far, and loops are usually the, the most computationally expensive part of your application. So this is the thing that you're going to look for first when you're starting to parallelize your code is like, where are my loops? Where are my expensive loops? And there are ways to do that too. If you're interested, you can do profiling of your code to find them. And yeah, there, there are training courses on that on the Moodle, uh, HPC Moodle. So if you don't know exactly what your application is doing and you just want to find the, the intensive, computationally intensive loops, there are tools for that. But if you do, your, do know your code, you just go to the loop and parallelize loops using data parallelism. How do we do that? Here's the syntax. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so we have, again, the headers, we have the serial code, and we have the OpenMP parallel directives. And here it is. Uh, uh, this is the, the parallel block, but here it's a little different. We're going to add uh, inside a parallel region right before the, the, the loop or for or a do loop in Fortran. You're going to add the pragma openmp4 directive. So after this, a for implementation uh, for loop must fall. So if you do have some other stuff that you're doing before that and you try to compile, it's going to give you an error. So right after this directive, there must be uh, a loop. OK, uh, in terms of the workflow, here's what's going on. Here's a parallel region. <laughs> yeah, that's not much to be said here, right? So here's a parallel region. And what I'm going to do is like create a team of threads. And each one of these threads is going to execute a task inside a loop. But the thing is that I'm going to be slicing my data in different chunks. And each one of them is going to grab a different chunk. Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to do. Uh, one application that the exercise that we're going to do here is uh, uh, Saxby. Uh, Saxby. Uh, and what it does is this very common... Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, per, it's just doing this. Uh, oh, I lost the word. It's just doing this simple uh, transformation. You have two vectors, y and x. And what you do is like for each element of y, and you also have a scalar, uh, which, which is just a number. But for each element of uh, y, you multiply the same index of it of, of x by a and then you add y and you update y with it you might be do, ask wondering why this is done uh this is sort of like a, a silly application but it's very very common in uh, uh linear algebra uh libraries so if you're doing matrix multiplication if you're doing diagonalization of a matrix uh, linear algebra operation in general 
there's a lot of times they're going to be need, need when you implement it, you need this sort of thing. So it's very handy. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's, uh, the code is there. Let's look at the, the serial code first. And again, I have my libraries, I have my array. Uh, this is the, the size of it again. Then I have the function declaration, Saxby, it takes uh, a number and two vectors, X and Y. Um, then I have, again, here, uh, instantiating my vectors and my number. So I'm filling up uh, X with random numbers, and I'm filling up Y with just ones. And then I'm setting A equals 2. And this is all happening here. And then I finally call my function that actually updates Y with uh, the Saxby. So Y, or oh, A times X plus Y. Okay. Uh, I think I have a, well, yeah. So here's the function implementation. It's, it's straightforwardly implementing what I just described. Here it is. It just goes over the entire, I pass it over. I pass the, the, the arrays or the addresses to the arrays over. I go over the array and I do this. So I'm actually, this time, if you think about it, I'm actually writing to memory too. I'm not just only reading. I'm updating why. Uh, okay. I think I have a poll here. Uh, yes, I do. So what does my poll say? Right, so that's a straightforward poll too. Do we need to change anything in the function implementation this time? Okay, uh, we have a pretty balanced poll this, poll this time. 60% thinks that uh, we do need to change the function implementation and 40% thinks we don't. Uh, so let's look it up. Let's, let's look it up. Let's take a look at it. Um, the code again, it's on the OpenMD folder. Uh, so I'm gonna go through it. So the first thing is OpenMD library has to be there. And then here it follows, and of course, the array size doesn't change, the function declaration doesn't change. And then when I look at my, when I really actually start my code here, the first part doesn't change either because I'm allocating vectors. And I wanna do that with just one single thread. I don't want multiple vectors being allocated. Then I start my time variables and I start and stop my clock. And I finally insert my uh, parallel region here. And what you're gonna see here, it's actually what I'm just, uh, the parallel uh, directive is only enclosing the function call. Why? Because remember that the, uh, the pragma open MP four directive must be followed by a four. So if I'm doing this by calling a function, I have to implement, I have to, to tell OpenMP, hey, this is a parallel region. So be aware, there's gonna be many threads working here. And when I when it, when it finds this function here and it goes into there, say, oh, here it is, here's a four. So I'm gonna engage all the threads in this four. This is what happened. So yeah, we did have to change the, 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 the function a little bit, but it's just one single directive, it's not much. Right, so this is how it goes. And here's uh, the workflow diagram of it. So we're just first setting up the variables, uh, allocating the vectors and, and the scalar. And then we're doing the loop by calling the parallel region around the function and then actually doing the four right before the four in the function. Okay, so this is how it goes. Uh, a little bit of... Uh, of uh, the thing here is that uh, how 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 does how does this uh, for loop here happens when you're doing it over multiple threads? So I have a size here that is a little over a hundred, a bit over a hundred million uh, elements in my array. 
So what happens is that when I do export open MP number of threads equals n, each loop is going to get a chunk that is that has a size of two to the twenty-seventh power over n. So here's how it looks for n equals four. I have four threads. They're all going to do sex b, but one of the threads goes i. I'm doing the loop over i. Gets a loop from i from zero to this number divided by four. The other one gets the next chunk. The other one gets the next chunk. And the other one just the next chunk. So if you don't specify anything else, and there are many, many knobs that you can work, many, many, many other things that you can insert after this to actually change the way this loop is scheduled. But if you don't do anything, that's what OpenMP does. It's called static scheduling. It's just going to divide your loop uh, over uh, uh, with the same size. What you could actually do too, it's called dynamic scheduling. It's like, I'm going to give you a chunk size that is not necessarily corresponding to, to, to this number divided by four, but say, I want to say the chunk size is 10. So I only have four threads. So each one of them is going to grab a chunk of 10. And when they're done, they come back and grab the next chunk that is, that is available until this is, uh, uh, this is all the loop is all taken care of. Abdel, what I mean to say is, how would that compare with the current implementation where the for loop is in the function? Uh, so you mean the for loop? What I mean to say is, how would that compare with the current implementation? Uh, you, you're talking about the parallel overhead. I think so. We're gonna, if it is, we're going to discuss that in in a, in, a, in a minute. All right. So go ahead, move to the SaxP folder, SaxPy folder, uh, compile, run it. Um, sorry, I, I I don't mean to interrupt, but no, no, you're a, fine. It was in the previous comment. I said mm -hmm. if you change the SaxPy function oh, so that it I took didn't. single. Yeah, so it took single inputs instead of vector inputs and then put the four out, you know, so the for loop, yep. instead of being inside the function was outside of the function, how would that compare with the current implementation? I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, thanks. I didn't see your question that was right above that. I'm sorry for that. Right, so the thing is that if you do a four over the function, so you do it like element by element, what happens is that so you're calling the function multiple times. So this is going to be not not a OpenMP overhead that you're having. The perform in terms of OpenMP, the, the parallelization game is going to be the same, but this is not a smart uh, uh, C++ call because you're having to call the function many many times. So you're going to have a function overhead there, which has nothing to do with parallel uh, OpenMP, but it is an overhead. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, so I guess you guys are working working on compiling and running this. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes and then we're, we're going to look into performance. I'm actually going to do this too. Good, I see some People are already starting to throw their uh, results. Okay, so mine is running. And this way, if you look at the job script here, just so you know, job script. What I'm doing is that I'm doing a loop uh, with different threads number, thread numbers, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32. And I'm calling the application with each one of them. All right, I see some of you threw it in there. So I have a poll about 
the performance. Oh, it's not now, sorry. The poll is not right now. So uh, it's in a couple of slides. All right, so let's take a look at a typical uh, example. Uh, here is Here are the results and this, it's not exactly like yours, but it's pretty representative of yours because what I did, it's in a different system and I did it uh, over 10 runs. So I ran the same thing that you guys just ran 10 times to get the average. Uh, and here is the T1 over Tn. Okay, so let's take a look at how, how this goes in a plot. So I have the number of threads as a, and a T1 over Tn is a number of threads. Um, and uh, I don't know about you, but when I see a graph like this, the thing that bothers me is that I have many points here and I have two points here. It means my scale is wrong. Why? Because if I look here, what I did is like I'm doubling the threads every time. So this is an exponential scale and this is linear. So I want a log scale here on both axes to actually be fair so that the points are equally spaced. Uh, yeah, so let's do that. Here's log scale. Oh. That looks much better to my eyes. Uh, so yeah, so let the, there's a few things that we can pay attention to here, right? The first thing is that in the beginning, it looks pretty linear, right? So it's actually a straight line. So doubling in the number of threads means that I have twice as much performance gain. So if you look here, I had two threads and my application is running two times faster. Four is almost four, eight is almost eight, but then start saturating. So, and it not only saturating, but it starts saturating towards about 15 times, 14, 15 times, but it's saturating, but how far is it from ideal? You know, like how, how you know, like for here, you know, I added eight threads and I'm running eight times faster. Here I'm, had, I'm adding 128 threads and it's only running 14 times faster. But to have an idea of how much it is, you can also plot the, the T1 over Tn equals N um, line. And this is what is called ideal scaling. And the distance from your curve to this one is actually how far you are from ideal scaling. So what you see, when you look at this, it's sort of easy to make the decision of actually using only eight threads. If you use more, you're going to be running faster, but you're going to be running you're going to be using way more resources. And the way these things work, we're not worrying about um, uh, this right now because we're, we're just experimenting with things. But if you, after you parallelize your application and test it, and then you're ready to send it over to a cluster, you're going to be charged for it. So you don't want to waste resources. So this indicates me that N equals eight is actually the best choice for this application. Why? There's a poll for you. Okay, um, so most of you thinks, think that um, too many threads to control in this patch, and some of you think that array size is too small to scale. Um, let's see, you're both right, but there's one, if, if we can blame it in one of them, there's one that is, that is more to blame. The first thing is that so it's called a parallel overhead. So threads are not much different than people. Uh, so if you look at this graph, you know, look what I had before. And if you look at this graph, it's just basically the same that's happening. So this is called the Ringelmann effect. And it's like, as you add more people to, to a group, their performance doesn't improve uh, linearly. So you start getting some uh, uh, saturated performance. 
Why? The losses, the losses are generally coming from you have to have, if you have more people, you have to have more management. You know, the, the way you manage things it just increases in complexity. That requires more communication spent between these people. And there are also task conflicts. Uh, people have to discuss what is best to do and what is not. And this takes time. And this goes into the process loss. Uh, in parallel computing language, this is called parallel overhead. So basically creating and distributing the workloads and destroying a larger number of threads just takes longer. Uh, so as you add more and more threads, you have to you know, uh, spend more and more time doing these things. But it's not really a concern here. What's going on here is a little different. So here, because uh, uh, 128 threads is not that bad, but this is, this is, uh, this is more the reason why it's not scaling. Uh, so here is a typical uh, processor with multi-core, and we have a shared memory, which is this yellow grid, and we have the CPUs. Um, so each thread, I didn't talk too much about that, but each thread, Usually when you're doing computational intensive tasks, just like HPC is, each thread is associated to a core. This is called thread affinity. So the thread affinity is high. Um, and then here's an example. Here's X and Y, the vectors that have two to 27 entries, which is like over a hundred million entries, but this is pretty small. So each one of these vectors only occupies half a gigabyte in memory. So two of them only occupy one gigabyte, and in expense, you have 265 or 56 gigabyte available. This is in a scale. So this little square here, the area of this little square over the area of this uh, white uh, yellow grid is one over 26, 56. Uh, so what happens is when I use two threads, and the arrow here is the distance, distance that this processing unit needs to run, needs to go through to actually reach the data. So as, as you add more and more threads, the distance increases. So what happens is that you're spending, you're spending more threads, but some of them are getting really slow and getting to the memory and actually finding that and giving it back. And, you know, they're, they're having to walk a lot. Uh, so ideal scaling also requires you, you're not only your threads to scale, but also your data to scale. If you really want to take profit of like, I, you know, like go full throttle with 128 threads, you have to find a way to actually fill out your memory as well. So you don't have this sort of waste here. So that's the reason why we're not seeing ideal scaling. Um, so this covered the last exercise and just, we have four minutes. I'm just going to quickly summarize that and point you to some additional materials uh, and, uh, and we're done. Uh, so the summary is like parallel computing is essential. Uh, everything is multi-core these days. So you have to learn how to, how to take profit of that, take advantage of that. The paradigm is basically, I, I think it's, all of it. There's no different way of doing things except for, uh, in terms of uh, fourth control, multiple instruction, multiple data. Everything works like this these days. OpenMP allows you for incremental parallelization with very simple directives. We only had to change the code a little bit, insert directives there, and then most of the work is actually thinking about where to insert in them. So there's not a lot to change in your code. Structural changes are not necessary at all. Task parallelism, using that, we improved the stats application by 2.4 factor and with data parallelism we improved the the saxby application by eight we actually improved by 14 but like we don't want to waste resources so we improved it by by eight so this was in a little over uh, 100 minutes so just two hours uh so it's a lot and uh i know you probably have a lot of questions but i just wanted to appreciate how how much you can get with, with such a not with such a small effort. Um, so this is with just two lines of code. And to be more concrete, so let's say if your application runs, uh, a serial application is taking a week to run, 168 hours, and you're able to take this course, take two hours, work on the additional exercises that I have for you, and then take a, take a step on parallelizing your own code and testing I'm, I'm giving you an afternoon to do that. 
and you're able to run your code faster, eight times faster, which is like a very modest gain here, right? So if you do all this, the return on your investment is 18.4 for one single run. So if your application was taking 168 hours to run, you do this, you spend eight hours and it's gonna run in 21 hours. So 168 minus 20 on, this is how much you gain with one run. After each of the first, after each one of the runs, after the first one, you get it for free. You don't have to do this again. So if I give you a dollar now, and I tell you that there's an investment uh, opportunity that in, in a week or so, it's going to give you back $18.40. You're going to do it. This is your time. For some people, time is money, but it's still a very good investment. So it's worth it. Give it a try. And we're here to help you. Um, so final assessment here, if you want to go ahead and do it, that'd be great. Let me know if you do it. I'd be happy to share uh to to up the, upload that to our github i want more exercises that are more representative for people i know we did sex b we did stats they're pretty like broad exercises so if you think about something oh this 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 is interesting to me i want to know about it uh let me know so the final assessment you don't have to do it but if you do either get a simple code that you already have or write one line up the steps to parallelize it draw your workflow diagram, implement your OpenMP directives, and share them with me. Uh, don't forget, we have intro to OpenMP. We're gonna be discussing a lot more things uh, 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 about OpenMP in the next workshop. And we also have MPI following and also deep learning. Weekly office hours every hour, every, every hour, every week uh, on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Let me know if you, if you, you know, give me feedback or if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Don't forget, there's also the, the self-paced courses. If you don't, if you want to go ahead and start working on those. Last thing is useful links. Uh, this is in one of the documents that I sent you earlier. I'm going to send it over again after the training session here. And the last thing, uh, feed us back, please. So there's a form here that you can answer. Uh, this is very important for us to just improve, making make things better for you and for others for the next training sessions, for, for the next... Uh, versions of these training sessions for different content. Uh, please take a few minutes to to go to this form. It's it's anonymous. All right. Thank you very much. Hey Bruno, there yeah. is one there is one okay. question in the I chat. See that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry that I didn't see that. I know it's out of space with this training, but can you comment about how this overhead is similar or different for GPUs? Yes, I can, uh, Travis. So with GPU, the overhead is usually a little different because let me go back here. If you have uh, a couple of minutes, I can show you more graphically what I'm talking about. And I know my slideshow is pretty large, but I just wanted to have all the arrows. Where's the GPU? Okay, here's the, G here's the GPU and the CPU. So usually the bottleneck when you're dealing with GPU is like a lot of your application is actually happening in the CPU level and you just send parts of it to the GPU. And the GPU has very access to its very fast access to its low to its local memory, but when you have to send things over, this is not very fast. It's called a PCI bus. This is usually the bottleneck when you're dealing with GPUs. It's actually transferring data between the GPU and the CPU. This is usually where things go bad. Uh, in terms of overhead, they're highly for for actually uh, uh, um, uh, distributing the task. Once the once the data is here. GPUs are extremely efficient uh, in terms of distributing loads. They're, they're actually designed to be, CPU is not very, actually designed to be that efficient in distributing workloads, but GPUs are. So once the data is here, there's virtual, virtually no overhead in using all of the, the cores. Uh, but the bottleneck is sending data over and getting data back so you can keep going with your application. Paul, what is your... Yes, it is. Uh, the, the presentation is available online. Uh, I'll send links at the end. Uh, I can post the, the form in the chat too, but I'll send, I'll send this over as a follow-up email later this afternoon. And uh, we're also recording this. Yes, we are recording this. So we're going to make that available to you too. Uh, and Emily, I'm getting to the link of the form. Sorry for that. Okay.
Here we go. How do I copy this? Here we go. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so I hope this was helpful somehow. And uh, I'll see you soon in the next training session or office hours. Yep. You guys are very welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks again, uh, Sandy, for designing and uh, Bruno, uh, muito obrigado. <laughs> prazer oh. em conhecê-lo. <laughs> uh, uh, muito, muito prazer. Uh, obrigado você. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Sandy, I think I'll send the email later today and uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for moderating. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hey, you want to stop the recording? I think I can probably do it, but... How do I do this? I don't know. Stop recording. Okay. Yeah.